So welcome again uh, to the uh, next part of today's conference on the future of multilateral diplomacy. You have made your way to the session that is dedicated to diplomatic training for new skills uh, and tools. First of all, how is this session structured? We have uh, excellent experts with us and each is responsible for a 15 minute segment bringing in um, their insights and kind of uh, starting uh, and kicking off the discussion uh, on various sub topics. So uh, that means uh, that we will hear for quite a few of them. Unlike the previous uh, previous segment, we do hope that this session will be more interactive. Uh, there is a space for that because there are fewer of us. Uh, and how can you do it? Uh, you can definitely interact again through the chat icon that you can see in the middle of the bottom of your screen. Uh, that chat is again moderated uh, by my excellent colleague, uh, Marco Lotti, uh, who will be the bridge between what is happening in the chat and what we are speaking about uh, at, at this session. But as this is a small session, uh, I do encourage you uh, to use your voice I would suggest that you use the raised hand um, button that is that you can get to when you get to participants and, and uh, press the hand uh, next to your uh, next to your um, uh, name. Uh, I would just like to ask, uh, sorry, my tech colleagues to make me a co-host that I can actually see who has raised the hand. Otherwise, I will not be able uh, to see that. So once again, we hope uh, to make it very interactive. Thank you for picking this session and let's kick this off. Our first expert that uh, that will be uh, responsible for the first uh, segment uh, is Mr. Uh, John Hemery. I will not be going through his profile because that is something that you can uh, read in more detail uh, on our uh, on our webpage. Or you could forget about the profile. Yeah. Uh, well, but also I would take too much of time to explain everything that uh, that you have been working on, John. But let me just uh, quickly uh, introduce the main topic that you are uh, you are bringing, uh, bringing to us, and that is new diplomatic training needs. What are they? Over to you, John. Thank you so much. Uh, and congratulations to Diplo and Jovan for this excellent initiative. Uh, personally, I'd like to be on the other four channels at the same time. Uh, and I hope very much that they're being recorded so that we can see them later. Um, second, very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that my contribution to this short discussion uh, has been helped greatly by my friend and colleague, Carol De Beer. Some of you may know Carol, a hugely experienced Dutch diplomat and a, and a great trainer as well. Um, before looking at new training needs, uh, let's focus very briefly on what stays the same. There's still a need for training in core diplomatic skills, uh, whether it's political analysis, reporting, briefing, especially influencing and networking negotiation. Diplomacy is still about people and empathy and human psychology. Uh, and that doesn't change. What does change in the time of the pandemic, of course, uh, is the means of training those core skills and qualities. So one of the key new training needs is training the trainers. Uh, many trainers are unfamiliar with the special skills needed for effective online training, uh, and maybe some are a little afraid of them too. I'd like to concentrate on two major additional changes in training needs. First, need for training in coherent strategic thinking. We're overloaded with information and confused by this information. And we have a we're deluged with a tsunami of emails and social media contact uh, and lots of new actors in diplomacy. Most of us have no time to sit back and think, where are we? What are we doing? Why? And we're so distracted with the changing detail that we easily lose sight of the wider context. What does this mean? What is our place in the broader perspective? I think this is where diplomats can add value to systemic strategic foresight, as well as helping to organize and manage that strategic thought. We need to think about what's happening in the multilateral system. Uh, this symposium uh, is a good example uh, of what is needed. And as trainers, we need to help diplomats to learn how to think about it coherently systemically, clinically. This isn't magic. It's simply focused discipline, marshalling of facts and ideas, applying logic as well as imagination to problem solving. We also need to listen to young recruits to understand their contribution to the changing dynamic. 
the young are miles ahead of us already uh, in understanding and using digital tools. And it's after all their future uh, that the new diplomacy will attempt to address. Um, I'm delighted that it's the Finnish ministry uh, that is supporting this symposium. Uh, they were one of the first, possibly the first foreign ministry really to address the importance of strategic foresight. Uh, and they produced excellent annual um, strategic foresight reports for their own foreign policy. Um, they're worth reading online. The second big change in training needs is, of course, training in using the new communications technology. This pandemic, no matter how short or long it may last, has already changed the way we do business, whether within the family or in business or in diplomacy. This Zoom meeting, for example, is almost like being there, but only almost. You know all this. There's, there's fewer body language cues, uh, less peripheral vision, less nuance, less feel for what's going on in the room, and especially if there isn't a corridor. Uh, operating online, especially negotiating online, requires new communication skills that need to be practiced. Uh, and I'll mention quickly just six uh, from my experience. Uh, and during John, the please, may I just interrupt you for yeah. little seconds? Uh, we are hearing some uh, noise, uh, mainly because you're probably moving papers on your desk, uh, trying yes. to avoid that, just that we have a better quality sound. I apologize tremendously for interrupting. Not at all. I apologize greatly for the rustling. <laughs> Allow me to keep rustling to, the, to, to a minimum. Okay. I was suggesting six uh, ways in which we need to be more aware uh, of skills in communicating and, and negotiating online. Uh, the first is that you need to think about uh, the order and cadence of speaking. When do I intervene? How long do I speak? Secondly, the style of my intervention. Do I be very strong? Do I come in quietly? Uh, that's a, an approach. Where do I look? In the camera, somewhere else. What do I do with my hands? Do I keep them out? Uh, I've seen uh, experts suggest that it's really important to keep your camera far enough away from you so that people can see your shoulders and your arms, your hands, so that you become a person rather than just a portrait. Uh, the practical skill of online training, uh, online negotiation involves getting people from plenary to virtual breakout rooms and back again. And that takes quite a lot of uh, skill to do it. It needs a moderator uh, to do that for you. And fifth, the increased importance of the old skill of assimilating new material quickly, whether orally uh, or written. Uh, and finally, I would suggest the greatly increased importance of a good chair uh, to be able to keep things coherent uh, and, and moving forward. Much more difficult uh, than face-to-face -face in a room. All those skills need to be rehearsed and rehearsed in simulation exercises, replicating what diplomats are going to do online in real life. Since uh, last February, my colleagues and I have conducted uh, negotiation and communications courses, uh, about 50 courses in, in six countries, uh, using either MS Teams, which is our preferred platform, or Zoom. Um, most of those have, have involved conducting multilateral negotiations uh, with as many as 24 different breakout rooms operating simultaneously, uh, each with instructions preloaded. Uh, each trainer covers no more than two pairs or two groups of four at a time, and that provides for personal feedback. And each trainer is supported by a technical moderator who moves people from one place to another and puts up the materials so that the trainer can concentrate on the people and the training. So that's the practical side of new training needs, new online skills. In addition, diplomats need two more things, new tools and new knowledge. And some of this has been already addressed in the, in the plenary session just, just completed. First of all, tools. You cannot take a full part in online virtual diplomacy uh, without a good technological infrastructure. Uh, and that's a real obstacle to developing countries obviously, uh, it's costly. And the gap in technical competence uh, in diplomacy between developed and developing countries had been narrowing. And now 
it's suddenly widened again. Uh, and that makes it difficult for poorer countries with less well-developed technological infrastructures to take a full part in the new multilateral diplomacy. And just today, uh, Mokhtar Yadali's experience uh, in the African Commission uh, in Addis uh, with two backup systems and a generator, and still he's cut off. Uh, those are the kind of practical, simple problems uh, that need to be resolved and they need help and support. Uh, and I'm delighted with Diplo's initiative uh, of the help desk. Uh, that needs to be part of a wider development discussion uh, on the provision of aid. Secondly, apart from tools, uh, diplomats need uh, new knowledge, especially about cyber. And it's part of the training package and you know, the automatic training package of any diplomatic academy or foreign ministry. Or indeed, as you will know, every line ministry has a national department. Everybody is doing direct diplomacy, often not through uh, the foreign ministry. So we're talking about whole governments uh, that are trying their hardest uh, to adopt this new capacity. Most people know a little bit about cyber or fake it. Uh, and very few uh, know enough about it. What is cyber? What are its risks? How do we manage those risks? How do we literally defend ourselves uh, against the aggressive use of cyber as an offensive weapon in an undeclared war? Most of us have simply no clue about what is going on. Uh, I'll give you one example. A major state actor hacked into last year uh, the computer system of the U.S. Department of Personnel Management, one of the lowest profile of government departments. And for six months, undetected, they stole the files of 22 million people. Uh, their personal details, their interests, their family history, their families, uh, their security clearances, a complete human profile. So our people, your people, need to be aware of these security challenges of the digital world. Uh, but first of all, we have to help them as trainers to understand what is digital security? What is behind the friendly interface uh, that you see on the screen? But it's not just about uh, security. Diplomats really to, uh, need to understand cyber itself. Uh, they need to be able to take an intelligent part uh, in the discussion about it, how it's developing, how those developments are affecting their own profession and the cultures uh, with, with whom they work. Of course, there's other new knowledge uh, that diplomats need uh, that they can't now be without. Uh, for example, the science of climate change or the science of global health, just two of the defining challenges uh, of the 21st century. That means recruiting a new generation of di diplomats with education in maths and sciences to sit alongside the people from graduates of, of humanities broadening and strengthening the base of knowledge uh, on the key issues affecting the global community. So that's what I think. Uh, there's the key new training needs for the age of COVID, strategic thinking, online technical skills, new technical knowledge, and continual learning. So I'd be delighted to continue the discussion with anybody who'd like to follow up. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you very much, John. That was definitely insightful uh, for your information. Uh, we are involved together with Diplo, uh, with you in the International Forum on Diplomatic Training, where we hope uh, that issues like this will, will be coming uh, on the uh, agenda because it's, it's a very essential uh, thing to consider. Uh, at this moment, please uh, feel free to just jump in um, uh, if you have any reflections uh, or comments. Um, uh, I know that uh, there is already some discussion going on uh, online with some uh, with some points from uh, Yolanda. Yolanda, would you maybe like to uh, react quickly to John's intervention? And others, please give me a sign somehow. <laughs> and please unmute yourself because I muted you, I uh, admit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, I really enjoyed uh, John's uh, points, and I want to reiterate something that I mentioned in the chat box. And this is that um, coming from Africa, the digital divide is likely to increase as a result of the pandemic. So for us, it is of crucial importance, um, um, something that needs to be raised in forums of, of development assistance, that Africa should be um, online and in the Zoom room. 
Um, otherwise, we're not going to find um, solutions to global problems. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanda. Uh, Stefano is giving me a, a sign. Please, over to you, Stefano. Thank you. Sorry, I'm giving you a sign because uh, I was not finding hand, hands up, which I always recommend. I find yes, no goes lower, but it doesn't matter. You know, even the classical uh, uh, hands up can, can work. And I, I, I thank very much, uh, John, for, for the very interesting elements that, of course, there's so many things that could be said. But I wanted to, to, to um, focus on, 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 on one issue, which is related to the six points, six ways, uh, which were, I think, very practical uh, elements uh, that we are confronted with every day, more or less, when we, when we use the video conferencing. I think uh, just having in mind these six different elements that were, uh, that were uh, listed, that this is a great opportunity for online training. Because I think the online training is perfect, easy, cheap, and uh, I would say even uh, mm, relatively uh, not too much demanding in terms of time for these sort of issues. You can do that online, you can check people, you can have one one on one easily. You can have one to many easily, and they can learn by doing. So, as usual, as in the past for uh, for training, I think also the practice is very important. And in this case, the practice is very easy in the sense that you can organize it easily. You know, one of the problems of of our ministries, certainly of my ministry, when you have training, is that people cannot move. They don't have time. They are stuck to this, and, and so so this is the use of online of online learning in this case of online training minimizes everything. So minimizes even excuses because sometimes these are excuses. We know that. Uh, I, I know it very very uh, no, on first hand, uh, and and uh, and um, so I, I I was just thinking. For example, you know, on, on the style, the order of speaking that, he, that uh, John mentioned, all, all these things, you can really it, very easily organize a simulation yes. and on the spots, just learn that I shouldn't have so much light on, on one side just to be seen better. Or, you know, your microphone, or you should not uh, do a lot of noise while you are speaking, all these sort of yeah. things. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you learn it quickly. Yeah. So this is an advantage. Well, some of this learn more slowly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but but sometimes you don't realize all this. But once you've done it, and practice, practice, practice. Certainly, yeah. it's yeah. it's again like in the past. There are very many points in common with the new, uh, let's say, uh, learning skills or the new uh, opportunities which are linked to the to, to, to the past. Like again, tradition and innovation they go together. No no doubt. And one more thing that I will anticipate uh, from what I wanted to, to say later on, because continue, continuous learning was mentioned, and, and certainly we all agree on that. I think we should seriously discuss on how this could be implemented in organizations, uh, starting from the point of view that continuous learning is not something which comes, you, you know, uh, um, how can I say, which comes by itself. You have to impose it. My experience is that you have to impose it. Either to impose it to yourself, which is, you know, very much related to the person, or the organization should impose it in some ways to the people. I, I'm very much in favor of the second. Of course, by imposition, I, I have, there should be, you know, the, the sticks and the carrots, as usual, on these things. This is another discussion, but I wanted to point uh, point this out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano, uh, for your reactions. And thank you, John, for uh, really uh, making us uh, think and contribute further. Uh, I would like now to go to the second uh, segment uh, of this session uh, that will be led uh, uh, by Professor uh, Yolanda Kem Spice. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm Spice. not sure. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> You're uh, an associate <laughs> professor at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi. And she will be talking to us about diplomatic training, how to prepare better for the next global crisis. So how can we? 
Thank you, Teresa. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you. And uh, yes, my topic is how to prepare better for the next global crisis. Before I um, speak to that topic, I have to give you the caveat that nobody knows what the next global crisis will be. That's why it's going to be a crisis. So uh, we are still dealing with this one and uh, we are just hoping to strengthen ourselves and our responses so that we are not necessarily going to be just um, reactive when the next one happens. Um, we are dealing with a health uh, pandemic, uh, which has spillover effects on so many other um, areas of global economy, politics and so forth. And I want to um, bring in a little bit of my own um, anecdotal experience over the past few weeks. I'm, I'm suffering from um, a shoulder injury and I've been going for physiotherapy and um, going through this therapy, I've learned how the therapists um, strengthen the muscles around the injured muscle so that those other muscles can help the injured one uh, pull along while it is um, healing. And exactly the same applies to organizations, to mon ministries of foreign affairs, for example. We need to strengthen them as a whole to make sure that wherever the next weakness will occur, that the rest of the organization will be as strong as possible. And exactly the same applies to global governance. As we sit here, most of us are proponents of, of diplomatic practice. Um, some of us are practitioners. Some of us, like, uh, like me, for example, used to be a practitioner. We want global, lo global governance to be strengthened, but we've seen serious flaws in our systems. And therefore, we also need to, through diplomatic training, build the networks, build the capacity of diplomats as the wheels that keep this global governance turning to be strengthened. Part of this can be addressed through diplomatic training that is also diplomatic networking by investing more in international training programs, by uh, having more joint ventures in, in diplomatic training. And on the same topic of, of um, a health crisis, John mentioned uh, the practice of training the trainers. And I am continuously reminded of the health workers who are pulling us through this crisis and how they are also in need of care. They are also um, human beings who get ill and they suffer from mental distress. And exactly the same applies to individual diplomats. They are at the coal face of, of this um, pandemic in dealing with their own nationals who are panicking, who are stranded. And these individual diplomats need to be strengthened physically and mentally. And we can address that even at the level of diplomatic training. For many, many years, we've just assumed that if people are intellectually capable and we provide them with uh, certain basic diplomatic skills that they are necessarily going to be um, good in the field. But we see through experience that the people who are good at what they do are people who are also physically and um, emotionally strong. I think um, ministries of foreign affairs should even have first aid kits in the form of human resources programs and um, emergency teams who can be brought in to make sure that diplomats are strengthened to the hilt. Um, diplomats, as I mentioned, of course, are caring for um, millions and millions of, of their expats who are living abroad, people who are temporarily abroad for work or other purposes. And, and this has highlighted the importance of consular work during this pandemic. Consular work has for a long, long time been seen as somehow second-class diplomacy. And this binary approach is embedded in international law uh, because we have a separate diplomatic convention, the 1963 diplomatic convention dealing with consular. Um, I think 
consular training should be integral to diplomatic training. I don't think you can be a diplomat without knowing how to be a good consular official. And, um, and this integral in this integration should also be applied within diplomatic practice itself. Now, John mentioned um, several principles in terms of, of dealing with the new um, format of diplomatic communication. And I want to emphasize that communication and the handling of information together with the representation are really at the heart of diplomacy. And this much is confirmed in the 1961 Vienna Convention. But we have taken for granted the, the means of communication and information gathering that we've become used to so very quickly over the past few years. And as diplomats and as teachers of diplomacy, we have to be um, in possession of the best possible toolkit. And when I just look at my own experience as a university lecturer over the past few months and the steep learning curve that I've had to overcome in moving 100% to online teaching, I'm actually embarrassed that I see myself as an expert in um, professional communication. Why did it take a pandemic for me to master all these hybrid technologies? Online meetings, of course, have their own new host of, of related skills, whether it's chairing skills or protocol related issues or um, security issues. And these need to be part of diplomatic training. And now, um, perhaps a final point, and, and Stefano has already raised this, but diplomatic training is a continuum. It is not limited to new or inexperienced diplomats. It needs to be done constantly throughout a career to upskill and to reskill diplomats. And I want to start at the beginning by ending my conversation by saying that diplomatic training starts with recruitment of the right people to do the job. I consider diplomacy to be an essential service, not just for national interest, but in the, in the service of humanity. And ministries of foreign affairs need to recruit individuals who are of the right mindset to do that kind of job because it is unpredictable. They need staff who are going to be resilient, who are going to be adventurous, who are emotionally ready for the next uh, global crisis and who can think on their feet. Not all of that can be taught through diplomatic training, but much of that can be strengthened. And I think I'll just end right there. Well, thank you very much, Yolanda. That was that was fascinating uh, to listen to you, uh, and uh, I think many diplomats will be flattered when you uh, when you kind of when they hear your description of what an ideal diplomat, uh, what skills uh, they should have, and hopefully uh, they will find themselves uh, in this. Any reactions uh, from others uh, from the chat? Um, not much in the chat. Uh, feel free, anybody to jump in. I think uh, John is giving me a sign. Uh, uh, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I love listening to Yolanda always. Uh, I just want to pick up her last point. Uh, I think it was uh, Kristalina Georgieva who said, uh, without emotional intelligence, we are lost. Uh, and if you had to pick a skill uh, to try or a quality uh, to imbue in diplomatic training, that would be it. Thank you, John. That was also an excellent point. Stefano, over to you, please. Yes, th thank you. I, I, if I can add on what Yolanda uh, said, and I fully agree with her, and I did analysis consular, I must say, I just lived through what she said, because, of course, the, these months in, uh, in an embassy with a consular office were exactly what, what she said, which means that you really have to understand people, not only the situation, people, you know, the daily problems. So empathy, emotional intelligence, uh, uh, compassion are not words. They are just elements for working. And this is not something that you can, uh, unlike what I said before, these kind of skills, they don't, it, they are difficult 
to, to simulate. They are difficult to teach. Uh, they are difficult to organize. That's why it's even more important to start early, early on and go on in making our diplomatic uh, colleagues understand that it's really something that they should learn, practice on themselves, because they're not something just for, you know, better living. It's just something for better working. And it's becoming more and more so, especially when you have uh, the, the tendency, and this is, I think, all over, to consider our uh, activities as services to the people. So the people, they expect to receive certain kind of service, not bureaucratic response. It's easier, of course, to have a bureaucratic response, but uh, this is not the, where we go, where we, we're going. This is not the direction. So it's, it's very important. And I, and I must say, I, I, I really try to, to include uh, some of these elements when I was director of the Diplomatic Institute in our ministry. And uh, I was not surprised to see that I was a bit uh, like a strange guy, you know, trying to introduce this. But this is, the more we explain why this is important, the more you won't be seen as a freak, but as somebody who wants really to, 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 to improve our profession. And I fully, I fully agree with the role of the counselor activities inside the wider diplomatic uh, uh, activity. It's, it's something where, you know, it's immediately with the outside world. So you, you are immediately confronted with certain things. I always stop here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Uh, would anybody like um, to jump in? Just please give me a sign or just jump in. Uh, Youssef, uh, please, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I want to comment on the recruitment point as an early step. I think uh, universities and colleges should choose the right fit who will study the diplomacy because not everyone who did the master's or the PhD degree should fit to be a diplomatic. Thank you. I think it's an excellent point. Uh, likewise, uh, you uh, will not necessarily be a good politician if you studied political science. Uh, any reactions on this point of uh, Youssef from our dear speakers? And anybody else, of course. Um, Teresa, um, yes. Um, I just want to say something about diplomatic studies in general, because we tend to bifurcate between a diplomatic training of professional diplomats and diplomatic studies in general. And I think there is so much more scope for um, integration and for cross-pollination, um, especially when it comes to research. Uh, people who have the, um, the, the privilege of a sabbatical to go and do a master's in diplomatic studies or even doc doctoral studies, they have the opportunity to do research the time they don't necessarily have when they are working at their foreign ministries. And I think governments and international organizations should draw on this resource that is available in the, in the research facility of so many institutions by giving topics, by giving issues that are vexing us to these students to investigate. I've been itching, for example, to give study guidance to somebody who's going to rewrite the diplomatic conventions. Um, and, and I'm not saying that they should be thrown out. I'm just thinking they are 60 years old and maybe the world is ready for something to complement them. Now, this doesn't necessarily um, need to come from any foreign ministry. It could come from student projects. The first um, 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 input into diplomatic law came exactly from Harvard-based student projects in the 1930s. And we should, we should call on global institutions that do diplomatic studies to assist the world with coming up with solutions for global governance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, now, uh, uh, John, uh, you would like to jump in uh, quickly, very, yes, please. Very quick pick up uh, Yusuf's point, because I think it's a really important one. Uh, and that is to focus on recruitment. Uh, 
people coming in at the bottom of foreign ministries or governance or indeed any organization, uh, we're going to have to focus on a new taxonomy uh, of what is required for doing digital mm -hmm. diplomacy. And the diplomacy writ large, uh, dealing with cross-boundary, cross-border, cross-cultural relations. Uh, and those new skills, new qualities, uh, new attributes are not necessarily the traditional ones. They certainly don't need high-level degrees because most high-level degrees are now born decades ago and closely structured and not necessarily what people need now. Trust the young on this issue. Thank you very much, uh, John. Next plan. Uh, we still have two segments to go. Uh, one uh, will be with Stefano uh, on digital diplomacy, urgent updates to our curricula. So kind of building nicely on what we have covered already. Uh, and the last but not least uh, by uh, Andrea Saramago speaking on Zoom uh, as a complementary teaching tool. Before we go to these segments, we will have a little break. Um, we will have a break of nine minutes <laughs> so we will reconvene here again uh, uh, in uh, in nine minutes please respect that uh, I suggest you stay in this room you just maybe mute yourselves to your video stretch your legs why we are having this break because we also want to kind of come in par with other sessions to enable uh, participants to jump uh, from one uh, to another uh, so uh, let's just stick around we can of course talk informally uh, but um, formally we will start uh, uh, Stefano's segment in eight minutes from now. <laughs> Thank you so far. <laughs> will be starting. Uh, I think we can go ahead. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but welcome back. Uh, if there are any new participants that have joined us um, uh, for uh, for this session uh, on diplomatic training and skills, uh, welcome. And we will be continuing our discussion. And uh, I'm giving the floor now uh, to Stefano Baldi, Ambassador Stefano Baldi, uh, again, big friend of Diplo. Uh, always pleasure uh, to have you with us. And my question to you, do we urgently need to rework uh, our diplomatic training curricula? Stefano. Yes, thank you. Also, on top of good friend, I'm an old friend. Uh, for the good and for the bad, you know. But it's, it's, it's very nice to see how many changes. And still, I hope to see many more changes, you know. If, 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 I, if I recall that we were uh, just... Uh, talking about IT in diplomacies, in diplomacy, you know, 20 years ago or something like that. Uh, now, now we are really moving, moving ahead. And it's, it's, I think it's exciting. Of course, my, my, my intervention is about moving ahead. I mean, what, what on, on training we should be doing. And I'm very glad that a uh, few things that I was not going to mention has been already been mentioned, which is, which are the skills on, on, you know, on, on this new video conferencing and virtual presence online. That has been covered. I fully agree with that. There's a lot of work to be done and still that will be keep changing. But there is some work that should have been done already and it hasn't been done or not to the extent that I, 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 I think um, it, should, it should be. And, and that, that um, it's, it's still a, a, a related to communication. I mean, it's always on the line of communication, which is for, for us diplomats is uh, essential, I would say, like for journalists, even if it's completely different way, but it's essential. It's not, uh, it's not uh, just an option. On communication, I still believe that we have a long way to cover on training for social media. Uh, I, wh what I see is that that is now the, the, the main line of uh, our communication. And I don't see uh, a lot of skills developed there. And I'm not talking about uh, the, the old guys like, like me. I'm talking also about the young guys. I think they're not skilled enough on this. Uh, and, and, and skilled enough is also is, means they should know um, certain tools, and certain uh, um, actions 
thinking of being a diplomat. It's it's not the same thing of being you know your your personal uh, Facebook uh, profile. It's it's completely different way of thinking. So what and this is a, a very wide range of issues that should be included in in the in the in the training because when we talk about social media we talk about certainly visual skills which is photo video we talk about marketing because of course it's about uh, reading what you do and the results you can get and, and how we, this is linked to statistics because if you cannot read the numbers of what you do you will never understand what you're doing this is this this deals with graphics because if you present something uh, you know put in the wrong way it won't work no matter what it is well, this is about ethics of course because I think this covers always uh, most of the issues we have. If you don't have in, in, in clear uh, boundaries uh, in, in what you do, you can easily, and that we see from some, you know, use of social media, even by very important people. Uh, so this is, these are all things, and I'm sure that there are others, that they go together in order to be effective in social media communication. So this is one big basket, which is missing, in my opinion. I have another one. I will be very short on the other one. And this is something that uh, it dates back even longer than social media and where I believe we are quite weak. We are still quite weak, which is uh, the use of data. Now we talk about big data, but I also would like to, to talk about small data. It, it, it doesn't matter. I think in, in the diplomatic world, uh, in the diplomatic profession, the, uh, the skills concerning the use of statistics, the interpretation of numbers, the use of numbers is still very weak. And there, is, there should be a lot of work to be done. Uh, because the, and again, we go back to recruitment and to the preparation before, you know. Generally, you have, a lot of people who says, you know, I'm not good at numbers for those who, who study political science or something like that. They start with this kind of state of mind, numbers, you know, I get lost. And this is completely, it does, it does nothing to do with your mathematical skills. It's just the attitude you have with numbers, with graphics. And if you cannot understand that, then, of course, you cannot use them properly, which is one point. But also the other, the other um, delicate point is that somebody can use them against you <laughs> and you are not ready or capable of understanding what, what this is about. And we have numbers all around us, uh, all the time. Even with coronavirus, we're always talking about numbers, parameters and whatever, indexes, whatever it is. So I will, uh, I think I, 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 I use my five minutes but of course, there are many, many other things. If I can add the last thing is that everything I say is, is taking into account some elements which are, I think, commons, common to all big organizations, certainly to Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are working now and in the future, I'm afraid, with limited human resources, with limited financial resources, and this is not going to change, in my opinion. So that's why I also wanted to focus on these two issues, which should be internal. They cannot be externalized. That's the point, in my opinion. Thank you. Stefano, that's, uh, that's excellent. Uh, I think we have a reaction from John straight away. So please, uh, please go, uh, go John. <laughs> Uh, Stefano, thanks very much for, for those insightful comments. I'd like to pick up your reference to graphics. Um, diplomacy very often is associated with words and how we use them. Increasingly, words are not as useful as visual representations. Uh, if you look at any good website now, uh, and there are millions, uh, they are more and more visual. Uh, and if you are stuck in words, uh, people don't have the time or interest uh, to read them. So one of the things that I think we're going to need more training is in helping diplomats, ministries uh, to convey their messages visually. 
Excellent. If I can add on this, I, I completely agree. But uh, one uh, clear sign that there is a long way to cover is how we communicate internally. Internally, we communicate officially and unofficially. Un unofficially is the email. And in the email, it's not easy unless you have an attachment to, to put you know, something graphics. So that's words. Let's put it, I simplify, I oversimplify. But if we go to the official, it's even worse because the official systems that we have, they are just a development of the old telegrams. They, I mean, internally different, they are different, but they're physically, they are made for words. They are not made for any kind of visual. Thank you. Uh, Andre would like to react now. Andre Saramago, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Those are very interesting uh, insights. I was I was th here thinking about um, the, the the negative side of these developments. I mean, to what extent is uh, I mean a growing reliance on images and on, on imagery as a tool of communication, certainly. But uh, might that not also lead uh, diplomatic services and the way we're thinking about diplomacy go after certain trends in society and actually there being a loss a loss of of the art of speaking and of the art of being a good, uh, good authority and, and, and so on. And to the extent that is not a fundamental aspect of uh, diplomacy. And uh, I just wanted your reaction as, as people who deal more directly and less theoretically with these issues. Um, to what extent is there not also a role for diplomatic services to cultivate a space which is safe from these trends in society towards great uh, speedy information, superficial information and, and visualization. So I just wanted to, to know your thoughts on this. Uh, uh, let's go to John first uh, and then to Stefano. Good point, Andre. I think they're complementary. Uh, they are interpenetrated. I, I, I have two reactions. The first one is to, to have uh, you know, a different world. Uh, in fact, we are not a different world because, and this is proved by the fact that I, everybody in the ministry keep pushing me. I have to be fast, to react immediately. So I'm not really, really living in a bubble. I have the same constraints of the rest of the world and this is not going to change. And I cannot tell them, look, give me a couple of days to think it over. No, I have to respond, you know, in half an hour. <laughs> and this is going on. So of course, in theory, it could be good. In practice, this is not the case. It's not going to be any different. We are going to be carried away. If we, if you don't want to be carried away in the worst possible, uh, in, the, in the worst possible uh, way, we we have to to find uh, a compromise. And when I say that we have to use more visual, I'm not afraid to lose my uh, uh, capacity to, 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 you know, to, to speak to people, to convince people. Because I, on the other hand, I think today and in the future, the visual will help me, will enrich you know, my way of conveying a certain message or conveying a certain uh, idea. If I stick only to words, uh, most people could could get, no, I don't want to say lost, but could be less uh, affected by what I say. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean substituting. Again, I would use a word that John just uh, uh, used is complementary. These things are complementary. At the, for the time being, it's, I, I see very little visual in our, in what, in, in what we do, in what we exchange. In, uh, in response to your reference to getting carried away, uh, as Keynes almost said, uh, in the long run, we're all carried away. <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> Could you say? Yes, please, Yolanda. Um, yes, this just uh, reinforces the idea that diplomats need good judgment. They need to know what to do, when to do, and how much of it to do. I want to return to something else that uh, Stefano raised, and that's the in, uh, issue of, of data, of of um, voluminous, voluminous information. We are curators 
of information. And I read this um, astounding statistic that over the past two years, more data has been generated, made available to the public than in all of the history of humanity previously. And just, just imagine the amount of information that is out there. Much of it, of course, fake news or not necessarily reliable. And as diplomats, we need to be trained to, to use information, but also to just delve through the mountains of information that, that is out there. It's becoming increasingly overwhelming. An excellent point, uh, definitely, Yolanda, that not only diplomats uh, are experiencing. Uh, but if you allow me, I would now like to uh, move to the last segment uh, of this session, and that will be uh, with Dr. Andres Saramago on uh, Zoom as a complementary uh, teaching tool. Uh, so uh, please bring us there, Andre. Thank you very much, Teresa, for, for, for your moderations for this invitation. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing this panel with, uh, with the remaining, with my fellow speakers as well. Um, well, my, my, I will try to keep this short in order to, for us to be able to have a discussion around this, especially because of the topic that I'm, that I'm talking about. It makes a lot more sense to have it in, on, on the, in the form of a discussion. But um, while Stefano was, was uh, mentioning the, 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 the elements of the curricula, my, 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 my focus is on the methods of delivering those, those curricula. And, um, and this arose from a situation, from an experience that we've been having uh, with Diplo recently, um, because more and more, I mean, for those of you who are familiar uh, with, uh, with Diplo courses, we, we, we teach uh, those courses. A lot of our participants on those courses are, are diplomats. Others are people who are not diplomats, but are interested in, in, in the general area of diplomacy. And um, uh, so far, Diplo's courses have been run on uh, using uh, not only lecture texts that people comment on, but also uh, online sessions. Uh, which assumed the form of a traditional chat session. So a text-based chat session of the type that we had in the, in the past before, uh, before more recent developments on the internet. And um, one of the interesting things that we've been verifying in the last few years is that increasingly our participants are expecting for there to be a more video-based form of interaction. And now with the pandemic and the generalization of the use of tools such as Zoom, um, there has been this greater expectation and the question arose to what extent it would make sense for either lectures themselves or at least these online sessions to be um, transformed into Zoom sessions similar to the one that we are having now. And, and so I've, I've, I've made a, a very brief contribution on a reflection on, on, on this topic arose, arising from my experience. On the, one, on the one hand, my experience with Diplo as, as both a course coordinator and, and a lecturer, but on the other hand, my, my, my experience also as a, a university lecturer uh, who is also using these tools in the context of the classroom itself. So in live teaching, I am also using this room, uh, these, these tools. And uh, I'm going to focus now on my experience with Diplo, but I would be quite open and willing to discuss also my, my experience um, at university. And um, one of the things that, that, uh, that I reflected and, and one of the arguments that I make is that indeed, uh, this type of video interaction and this type of tools such as Zoom bring uh, um, a whole set of advantages and a whole set of benefits. Um, but also, they, something is lost when comparing to previous methods such as the online uh, text-based type uh, of interaction. And that's why, uh, just to pick up on the topic of what we were just discussing, uh, I try to make the argument that Zoom makes sense, yes, but only as a complementary tool of teaching, not as a substitute, okay? And the, 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 the main, the, there are a, a set of reasons for, for why, why that is. So one of the things that reflecting on comparing uh, online text-based chat sessions with Zoom forms of interaction, is that uh, uh, we come to realize that actually there's, there's a whole set of pedagogical benefits for having a text-based form of online teaching, okay? Namely, uh, you will realize that, uh, that, uh, that now we are here discussing uh, ideas and only one of us can speak at each time. And we, are, we, are always, we have this pressure, this group pressure to speak fast and to speak in a very short way in order to convey our meaning. 
um, while in, in the online chat, chat, chat sessions that Diplo frequently uses, we see that it is possible for several participants to be speaking at the same time, in the sense that they are typing their ideas and presenting them, and their ideas cascade throughout, throughout the screen. And this means that, interestingly, uh, the types of interactions that we have been experiencing when comparing Zoom sessions to uh, text-based online sessions, we, we've discovered that actually text-based online sessions actually permit people to uh, present uh, more developed uh, thoughts about a certain, a certain topic and to actually to go into greater depth in the discussion. Okay, it actually makes it harder for the lecturer to be moderating all of these inputs from several participants, but actually it allows people to go deeper into, into, into the discussion. So topics are, are discussed in, in much greater depth than they are when we are using uh, Zoom sessions. And so people are also able to share their views simultaneously. And there's also greater room for reflection uh, on the part of the participants and for them to, 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 to react. Uh, to each other. And furthermore, of course, um, this is something that, that happens also with chat sessions, and at least in the way that Diplo uses them, is that it is possible for afterwards to make these uh, chat sessions available as a transcript in, in, with which people can still interact, uh, but which they can also print and take with them and, and to, to, to read and, and to reflect. Okay? And this actually, the way that people works with chat sessions, uh, it allows, it makes them more interactive than the type of interaction that one would have with the recording of a Zoom session, for example. Okay? Of course, there's, there's a big downside to these chat sessions, which is the feeling that since everything is text-based, we are not seeing each other. I mean, John, John made a very excellent comment uh, previously about even, even in Zoom, we don't have all the body language, right? And we don't have the, the feel of, of the other person. And, and this loss of feeling is even increased when we are talking about a text-based uh, chat session. And uh, that leads to a greater feel of disconnect between students and lecturer, namely, okay? And uh, I would say that uh, the Zoom sessions actually bring that. So it, they bring a, big, a, big, a greater sense uh, of connection uh, be, between people. And, um, and they are quite complementary in that sense, in the sense that if we are able to make Zoom sessions throughout the course, um, so, so a few Zoom sessions periodically throughout the course, uh, students and lecturers can re-engage with each other in, in a more uh, emotional way, if one can, can, can use that, uh, that word. Um, and, uh, and of course, as, as I was mentioning, but on the other hand, Zoom sessions also oblige participants to make their intervention significantly shorter, uh, significantly more superficial. And this means, and this connects a bit with the question that I posed to you. I mean, to, 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 to what extent uh, there, there is not a certain loss of uh, reasoning and more in-depth reasoning uh, about certain topics if this becomes the only way of conveying teaching and the only way of conveying information. And increasingly, we have also some complaints on the part of students that why does the lecturer not simply record a video or make a Zoom session with us? Why are we obliged to read these lecture texts and actually to engage in writing with lecture texts? And um, the argument is that doing otherwise, there would actually be a loss on, on our capacity to, to discuss things in depth, our capacity to, to mobilize language and mobilize written language in order to be able to, to, to discuss issues and to see the several dimensions of um, a, certain, a certain topic. Um, and that is the reason why uh, uh, one of the arguments that I made, but this is quite discussable and, and the idea is exactly to have a discussion around this is that I'm, I'm mentioning that Zoom is absolutely essential nowadays, especially to make this connection between people. In the context of deep courses, we're talking about people all over the world. But at the same time, it can only be understood as a complementary teaching tool and not a fundamental uh, substitute for methods which might not seem as sexy uh, because they're older and they're more traditional but they have a whole bunch of pedagogical advantages that sometimes are lost in our um, engagement with Zoom, for example. Of course, and, but uh, I had this point to raise as well, but John already rose it quite well. Um, in order for this complementarity to work well, it is, fundamentally, it is fundamentally for the organization, in this case, Diplo, to have the required technical skills to do it. 
Okay, so one of the things that we've we've discovered in our Zoom uh, sessions that we that we used on some courses was that it was absolutely essential to have technical support uh, in the background. So, for example, today we have here Marco moderating the discussion in the in the set session, which means that we we cannot we cannot be constantly looking at it, uh, but also having technical support which allows. For example, whenever a participant was having uh, technical difficulties in accessing Zoom, that technical support would be helping the participant in the background while the lecturer could focus on those that, that are present. And this is very interesting. I mean, just to give you this brief note, comparing that experience, for example, to my experience in the classroom, when their technical support is not immediately there, uh, that disrupts uh, the, the, the class whenever there are uh, technical issues and uh, as Yolanda quite quite well mentioned these technical issues are uh, potentially a source of inequality between between participants if, if if we're talking about people in different areas of the globe with very different levels of access to certain uh, to networks and to certain levels uh, of technology and, and engagement and so I just wanted to to, to raise these uh, these these topics and uh, and to discuss them further uh, and, and try to highlight how they connect a bit to some of the discussions that we're having so far. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andre, uh, very much uh, for bringing this additional complexity. Um, uh, by the way, before we go to questions, uh, we've been talking about Zoom, uh, but um, I think any other online platform uh, could come in place. Uh, uh, so, so just to uh, just to clarify, uh, clarify that as we have uh, researched a lot in the contact lab uh, in our comparisons of online platform, this certainly is not the only space uh, when uh, when learning and other uh, other events can be happening. Uh, please give me a sign if you want to react. Uh, John is giving me a sign and then Yolanda. John, to you. Uh, Yolanda, you go first. I have over the past few months attended more seminars and more conferences than ever before. And in a certain sense, I realize how much I have been missing out because I was always too busy to go in person to wherever these conferences and seminars were being held. And I was thinking this needs to be part of diplomatic training for diplomats to attend global seminars and conferences as part of their daily duties. Um, I, I know just too well how, especially the diplomats who work hard, never have time to do it. But I think it offers such an opportunity for us to link into networks around the world with all the negativity that comes, you know, the, the downside of, of Zooming. But it has so many advantages of just being exposed to so much more that's happening in the world. Thank you, Yolanda. John, please. Um, Andre, thank you very much. Uh, two points, uh, or to pick up on two of the points that you made. Uh, you've said that shorter interventions uh, very often can be superficial. Uh, I don't think shorter need to be superficial, but it does point to training, uh, enabling people to make clearly compressed sense. Uh, that's a real skill of writing, a skill of thinking, uh, and few have it, but it can be taught. Compression. Secondly, uh, on training, especially for trainers, uh, you mentioned the great complexity of uh, gathering together side conversations in the chat. Uh, and if you happen to be uh, the, the main trainer and there's these other conversations going on, uh, there could be a temptation perhaps to be irritated by or to ignore it. Uh, it's a real skill to integrate those side conversations where people are stimulated to think and are thinking with each other uh, and bring it into uh, the overall conversation. I think that needs a lot of training for the trainer. And, and similarly for a chair, uh, if there are these chats that are going on in a meeting and the main meeting is saying this, but there's also something else going on, that requires training to integrate them into a coherent whole. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, there is a, there is an interesting comment also from Ingrid Omanha uh, in the chat, uh, uh, adding to uh, to Stefano Baldi's comment on visuals. Uh, visuals have a lot to add to the digital rhetoric that should be just uh, that should be adjusted to virtual uh, environment. Yes, good point uh, there indeed. Uh, Stefano, I wanted to add on what Yolanda just said on, on the. 
opportunities that, that we have and we have lost in the past for sure. Uh, and, and also to bridge this with what I said at the beginning on continuous uh, learning and continuous training. I, I still believe that uh, uh, we will always be too busy uh, for uh, this kind of opportunities until we are obliged. This is something where that I am I'm very much convinced. I mean, there are a few things where uh, trainers should be uh, very practical, not idealist. Uh, we keep saying how much training is important for, for your life, for your profession. And uh, when nobody has something to talk about, they talk about training and how important it is. That's true. That's fine. It's okay. But then we have to make it happen. And to make it happen, as I said before, we should really uh, create some kind of obligation. I am convinced, and here I share it with you, that this can be done with credits. It's nothing new, you know, just credits, like a university. But even during the lifespan, professional lifespan, you have to keep having credits in five, five years, in one year, it depends, it can be. And the credits are seminars, courses. And since you don't have time to move and to stay away and you have to keep working, this can be done online. And that's it. That's it. How you keep growing. And people will complain. I mean, everybody. I will complain. I will complain because I don't have time. And these people, they want me to, to attend uh, you know, the seminar. But then if I make the right choice, I will, I will discover a lot for me and for my work. And my work will be much better. And, and I always say, would you trust any uh, physician, any you know, uh, specialized uh, doctor who has to intervene on you and you know that he hasn't been training in the last 10 years? Would you trust him? Would you go for that? I wouldn't. I better not know. I'm not saying that we are doing the same thing, absolutely, as diplomats. But sometimes it's better to be, you know, more updated, let's say, uh, than to pretend to be. And I think we should impose this one way or another. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Stefano. And I'm afraid we have used the time that was dedicated to this session. Uh, if I may ask uh, our colleagues uh, to um, give us instruction on how to quickly get to the main room, well, when we will reconvene just for a few minutes uh, to get some teasers uh, from, uh, from other sessions. So uh, Marco has just published in the chat a link. So please uh, click that uh, and um, uh, we will meet there hopefully in one minute. Thank you.